So, the title of my message this morning is, Why Was Jesus Born in a Stable? Why was Jesus born in a stable? You say, well, because there's no room in the inn. Didn't you listen? You know, Luke chapter 2, right? Well, why was there no room in the inn, though? Well, because Caesar Augustus said, you know, if you made a, made a census, right? You know, all the land was supposed to be taxed, and everybody was supposed to go to their, you know, their, um, their family's uh, area. And so why was Jesus born in a stable? Um, why, why was he laid in a manger, right? Because, I mean, normally people don't sleep in a, you know, a trough where animals eat, right? Um, you could also ask, well, why did he grow up in Nazareth, right? Um, and Nazareth, you know, if you remember, and, you know, um, of course, you know, it was, it was prophesied that he would grow up in Nazareth, Nazareth, in uh, Matthew 2, starting in verse 23, it says, And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. So it was spoken by the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. Right? And uh, if you remember from John chapter 1, if not, you can turn there, but it's, we're, I'm just going to read two verses. John 1, verse 45 and 46. It says, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law, the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. So Nazareth had a bad reputation, right? It was like the bad area of town or the bad city of the country, right? And, and, uh, Jesus was, was lived there. Why, why would Jesus live there? Like, I mean, God is his father, right? Um, he had all this glory before he came to the earth. Why would he be, you know, grow up in these circumstances? Why, why would he be born in these circumstances? Why would he grow up in Nazareth, right? And not just that, people called him Jesus of Nazareth, right? That was, that's how they referred to, to that man, right, to, to our Lord. Uh, Luke 18, 37, and they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passed by, right? That was because, and why would they do that? And, I, and I, this wasn't in my notes, but why? Because Jesus wasn't just a name only Jesus had. Because it's just the 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 Greek form of, of uh, Joshua, right? In fact, I think there's two places in the New Testament where it says Jesus as referring to Joshua, okay? Um, and of course, you know, even Joshua in the Old Testament, his name changes already there um, in different places. His earthly dad, who wasn't really his dad, but his, you know, stepdad was a carpenter. Now, that's not the most glamorous job. It's a good job. It's a, a job that, you know, is, is honorable. But he grew up, his dad was a carpenter. His dad was not a politician, which is not many cases an honorable job but it's it's one that has a lot of um stature right it's like your, your dad would be something important if if they were you know a politician a mayor or, or uh you know the family of the king or something like that right in uh, matthew 13 starting verse 53 i'm gonna if you you can quickly turn there. Go ahead. I'm going to be reading a few verses there. Starting Matthew 13, verse 53, it says, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Like you're surprised, right? He said, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary, and his brethren James, and Joseph, and Simon, and Judas? Why are they surprised? It's because he grew up so ordinary. He didn't grow up in this family where all the kids went to university, or the equivalent of that back then. Right? And he, he grew up in an ordinary household. And I don't know how the Catholics can say you know, that Mary stayed a virgin because he has brethren, right? James is his brother. Joseph, Simon, Judas, four brothers, and then also sisters, right? Verse 56, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence 
then hath this man all these things. He's like, isn't this just a carpenter's boy? Right? Isn't he like from this family with these brothers and, and these sisters? Right? He says, and they were offended in him. And Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. It's just Jesus. We know Jesus. We grew up with Jesus. We've you know, seen him grow up, right? And he's, his dad's just a carpenter. He's not anybody famous. He's not anybody important. This is the things they're thinking, right? And so why would God allow Jesus to grow up in these circumstances? Turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. It's a carpenter's son. He grew up in Nazareth. All these things, Right? Now, let's say if it was somebody else, right? And let's say it's uh, um, some famous person's daughter, right? And she, this guy from Nazareth, now obviously Jesus didn't date, let's say this guy from Nazareth, and he's a carpenter's son, and he wants to date this important person's daughter. It's like, from Nazareth? Really? You gotta be kidding. Can you find anybody better to date? Like, that's the kind of attitude they would have had. I mean, Nathaniel is saying, like, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And some people have this attitude of different parts of different cities, right? That's a really bad part of the city. Can any good thing come out of that, right? And God had a purpose, though, to allow Jesus to grow up and so that. Nothing in the Bible is accidental. Not, nothing in the Bible is coincidental. Or incidental, right? It's all important. It's none of it's an accident. It's all on purpose. If you're in Philippians chapter 2, let's start looking there in verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. But he knew before he came to this earth, I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to have no reputation, right? I'm just going to be like an average person, he's not going to come as a king, although the wise men saw the star, and they, they came, and, you know, they, they came to the house, you know, it always shows them in this stable, but by this time, they were, I believe they were still in the house, or sorry, they were back in the house, right? And then he got, you know, kingly gifts of gold, myrrh, and frankincense, right? But he made himself of no reputation. There was a reason God chose this time, for Jesus to be born. This time when there is no room in the end. They have to go into the stable. Because you're not going to. I mean the woman's going to have a baby. You're not going to be out in the cold. During the night. Right. And this little baby. Yeah you can wrap it in swaddling clothes. But you got to have some shelter. What if it rains. Right. What if there's wild animals. So he made himself no reputation. But made himself no reputation. Took upon him the form of a servant. It was made in the likeness of men. So not only, not, you know, no, no um, big title or anything, but he made himself as a servant. It says, in being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Right? Nobody else humbled him. He humbled himself. And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So Jesus, Jesus was willing to do this. It's not like he was forced to do it. It's not like he had to do it as far as um, when somebody made him do it. He's willing to die for us. He's willing to humble himself. He have no reputation, right? Um, it says, wherefore God also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Because he did this, he's got a name that's above every name. Every, you know, every knee, well, it says that in verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth, things under the earth. And that every time you should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So he's got such a name that everybody is going to bow their knee at him one day. Well, there's people right now that make, would mock Jesus, right? They'd mock the name of Jesus. But one day they're going to bow the knee. They're going to be begging for mercy. Um, what's the guy that, that, that atheist is? Stephen Hawking, the guy that died already? Right? He, he has bowed his knee to Jesus. He has begged Jesus. Uh, the Pope, you know, Pope Francis, I heard the other day he's doing pretty bad. Maybe pretty soon he's going to be in that hell that he says there is none, right? And 
He's going to have a hot place in hell, too, because he just said it's okay for a man and a man to get married. In the Catholic Church, that's okay now. Right? But it's not, this sermon isn't about him. But anybody, the heart, most hardened atheist, everybody is going to bow their knee to Jesus. So he's got an important name now. But when he came to earth, though, he, he set aside his glory. He set aside all the things he had with his father before the, the earth began. And he humbled himself and he came to be a servant. So that's my first point. He came as a servant. That's why he, why he was born and he grew up under these circumstances. Right? Because he didn't come with a, born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He wasn't just weighted on hand and foot. I'm sure he had to pull his own weight in the carpenter's household. Right? You know, he probably had to carry some wood for his stepdad. Right? I'm sure he had to do some work. Right? Because that's how it used to be. Nowadays, a lot of kids get away without doing work. Well, I can do it faster myself. Well, no, get them to do it and teach them things so they're not useless to society. Or worse than useless, a brain in society. So he came as a servant. Turn to John chapter 13. He was born in a stable because he came as a servant. He was born in Nazareth. He was in a carpenter's household. He made himself of no reputation because he came as a servant. John 13, starting verse 4. So he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. This is close to the day of his death, by the way. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith to him, He that has washed me is not saved to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and you're clean. You're clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, You're not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you. See, this was an object lesson, right? Did they really have dirty feet? Who knows? Well, they walked places with sandals, so maybe they needed a washing. But he's saying, do you know what I did? Because it wasn't just washing his feet that he did. He says, you call me Master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. Right? Because they called him Master. They called him Lord. And, he, and he, that was right, because he was and is. He says, if I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example. They should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happier are ye if you do them. He's saying, the servant isn't better, but yet the master washed the servant's feet. Because the master himself came as a servant to help us, right? And one day, and this is going to be really humbling, I think, is one day he's going to gird himself and serve us, right? At a supper in heaven. It's going to be humbling. This, this, I'm sure this was humbling. Like Peter's like, you're not going to wash my feet. That was embarrassing. Like God himself is going to wash your feet. Your Lord, your master, is going to wash your feet. But he says, I have given you an example. Now people, some people think you've got to do this in churches. But Jesus says, I gave you an example. They're missing the point. This is an example that you serve other people. That you should do as he did to, for, for them. Right? Realize that you need to serve. Because Jesus served the disciples. He died for us. He came as a servant. Now the second time he comes, he's not coming as a servant. He's coming with a sword. He's going to clean this place up. He's going to clean earth up. And I mean, just like an army, what do they do before they come in with the tanks and the infantry? They get the air, the air uh, attack and they just bomb everything, weaken everything. Not that Jesus needs it, but there's going to be some bombing, right? Fire and brimstone coming down from heaven. They're going to carpet bomb the runway, that so to speak, right? He's, they're, they're going to be like just totally softened up. But yet there's going to be people just yelling and screaming at him and hating him. But Jesus is going to come and clean those people up, right? 
Second time, he's not coming as a servant. The first time, he did. Because he wants, he's not willing that any should perish. He wants as many as possible to get saved. He came as a servant. He didn't come with a whip and, hey, everybody, listen to me. Hey, everybody, you better get in line or you're going to go to hell. Now you can preach some hard sermons. I'm not saying that, but he came as a servant. And he did. He did, you know, braid that rope and made a scourge and, you know, chased the money changers and the people that were selling stuff out of the temple. But he did it, you know, by the authority of God, of God the Father. Right? You made my father's house a house of merchandise. It's a shame that even Baptist churches are, are selling stuff in a bookstore. Oh, yeah, but they're Christian books. I don't care what they're selling. They were selling offerings and, and changing money for things that they're supposed to do, but it was an abomination to do that in the church, in the, in the temple, in the synagogue. So he came as a servant. But number two, he wants us to decide. Right? He didn't just come with all his power and might and all his glory. It's like, oh, of course this is the king. Because then obviously there's still be people that would just give lip service to him. There's just people be like, wow, okay, I'm going to serve him. But not really worship him in spirit and truth, though. Right? He wanted us to decide. Turn to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. And he wants us to decide. Right? Because God could have made us he could have made us without a mind like we have, right? He could have made us so that we just automatically worship Jesus, but he didn't. He wants us to, to decide. In Isaiah 53, starting verse 1, it says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And this is quoted in the, in the New Testament, right? It says, who's, who's obeyed the gospel? Not everybody's obeyed the gospel. Verse 2, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. This is talking about Jesus now. And as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness. And comeliness would be like attractiveness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So people wonder how Jesus looked. He was not attractive. He wasn't handsome. People didn't, you know, the women weren't just, you know, you know falling down before him, that they, they you know, that they were uh, attracted to him. There's no form nor comeliness, no beauty that we should desire him. Right? And I just went to my next point. I'm not quite ready, ready to go to the next point yet. This is verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did the stream of stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. So God wants us to decide. It's not just like, while you with his good looks, or good looks with his you know charm, with his um, um, you know death, you know um, you can tell I'm not. Um, what's the word I'm looking? For? Eloquent speeches. Right? Although he did, like his, his his words were like really good words. But he didn't come just to impress people with. His, his ways, he wanted people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved, right? He wanted people to decide to, to, to serve him. He gives us choices, right? In the Bible, there's like watershed moments where, where people have to decide, like, choose you, choose you this day whom you will serve, right? right? If, if God's the Lord, then serve him. If not, then don't, right? There, there's different watershed moments where people are like, hey, decide you're going to serve Christ. Decide if you're going to serve God. And he wants us to decide. He obviously, he wants us to choose him, but he doesn't want people to be forced to choose him. They've got to choose him out of their own will, right? He's not willing that any should perish, but he's not forcing people, right? We're not Islam where we, we, we make converts at the barrel of a gun or through a beating or something like that. But look at uh, verse 3 there. Okay, there in Isaiah 53. It says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He went through some tough times here on earth, right? He had, he had a man of sorrows. He had sorrow, right? I mean, he was in, in, in Psalm 24, short uh, psalm there, 10, 10 verses. Might be a short um, sermon this evening. I'm going to. I'm going to say I'm going to try to, to make it shorter, but um, we'll see how it works. I can't really, you know, 
pinpoint. Like, I'm not that good. Like, I don't know how much practice I know exactly how many minutes. Uh, it starts out there, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. And so what David is saying here in the psalm, and obviously by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that everything is God's, right? The earth and the fullness thereof. What's the fullness? It's like all the good things, right? The, the, the fullness of the crops, fullness of any kind of wealth, right? And, says, and they that dwell therein. So every single person is the Lord's, whether or not they're saved, but, you know, they might not be the children of the Lord, but they're still under his control. He still owns them. Um, and the verse I thought of when I saw this was Psalm 50, uh, verse 10. And you can turn to Psalm 50. Keep your finger there in, in Psalm 24 or a bookmark or something. This is going to be back. And I'll start reading verse 10, Psalm 50, verse 10. It says, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. See, in Psalm 24, it says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Here he's saying, Every single beast of the forest is every single raccoon, every single gopher, squirrel, deer, elk, you name it, right? Birds, worms, whatever. They're all the Lord's. And it says, The cattle upon a thousand hills. Now, cattle is something they used for food, right, for protein in the Bible days. Now, cattle, we think of cows when we think of cattle, but actually sheep and goats are also considered cattle, especially in the Bible. And he says, the cattle upon a thousand hills. Does Canada even have a thousand hills? Maybe it does. I mean, some of the mountains, right? You know, the biggest rancher in Canada, it's Douglas Lake Ranch. They have 20,000 head. I don't think they have a thousand hills of cattle. Okay. That's 20,000 head. That means 20,000 animals. 20,000 head of cattle. So, well, yeah, but the U.S., they've got this bigger ranch. It's called King Ranch, right? It's like a huge ranch. 825,000 acres. And now, I don't know how accurate this number is, but it's on the internet, so it must be true, right? 35,000 head. They might have more, but 35,000 head. That's a lot. Okay, that's a lot of cattle, 825,000 acres, and that's in Texas, I believe. So that's the biggest one in the U.S. No, it's not. There's actually one bigger. It's called Singleton Ranch. They have a million acres. I'm assuming that's approximately. And they're in California and New Mexico. And I don't know how many head of cattle they have, but on, on the search it said 40,000 yearlings. Now, they do keep you know, the calves over one to the next year, so that might be two crops. They have 40,000 yearlings. That's a lot of cattle. And you know what? They still don't have as much as God does because God owns every single cow in the whole wide world on a thousand hills. And, and there might be more than a thousand hills in the world. But this is obviously a song, and, and you're not going to say, well, it's actually you know, 9,437. It just doesn't flow nice in a song, right? Or however many there are. But it, the cow, it's a big number, right? A thousand. It's, in other words, he's saying everything is mine. And then the, the song goes on there in uh, verse 11. It says, I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. He said, every single thing. It says, if I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine, the fullness are up. You know, people in the Old Testament didn't do animal sacrifice because God was hungry. He said, if I was hungry, I wouldn't even tell you. Right? It says, will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? So he, he, he said, don't do offering because I'm hungry. Because that's not why you're doing offering. And he explains it why. He says in verse 14, offer unto God thanksgiving. So when you're giving God an offering, the Old Testament was a burnt sacrifice. Today we present our, our bodies a living sacrifice. We're doing it out of thanksgiving, not because God has need. We don't tithe because God has need. We don't offer, in the Old Testament, we didn't offer animal sacrifice because God was hungry. It's because you're giving God thanksgiving. It says, and pay thy vows unto the Most High. And call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. So that's our whole purpose on the earth, is to glorify God. He made us, and we should give honor and glory to our maker. Um, we have other work to do, but it, even the other work we ha have to do is to glorify God. In different ways. Soul winning is to glorify God. We get more people saved, and they can glorify God, right? Um... And everything that you do, you do it heartily as to the Lord, right? And as unto the Lord, like as if you're, even your job that you do, you're doing it as if you're, you're trying to do it for the Lord. You're doing it with a happy attitude, you're doing it not, not uh, sloughing off, you're, you're, you're doing a good job, right? 
and we should give honor and glory to the Lord. Everything's God's, and he gives us some, and then we give some back just as a thank you. Not that, oh, you've got to give me, like, the dad tax, right? Like, when, you know, you go through a drive through and the dad maybe snitches a couple of fries before he passes it to the back, right? God, God's not doing a dad tax, right? He's, but he is saying, hey, I've given you all this blessing. Show me how much you're thankful for it and give me, you know, a tithe back. For an Old Testament, they would actually barbecue animals. I mean, New Testament, they barbecue animals too, but it's not like a, a thing that we're commanded to do. And not as part of our religion, right? It's just to um, eat. It says in, in, now in Psalm 24, verse 2, it says, For he hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. Remember, this is talking about the world, it's talking about the earth. What does that mean? He's founded it upon the seas and established it upon the flood. He's made the earth upon the seas. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. Let's see if we can figure out what this means. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. And I'll start reading from verse 1 there in Genesis 1 as you get there. It says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So God, in the beginning, the first day, he creates the, the heaven and the earth. Okay, He actually makes the ball, well, it's a flat earth, or it just got, it got triggered, but it, he made the, the ball of earth, right? Um, and he made the heaven. And notice what it says, it, it was void, though. It was without form. It didn't, didn't have, like, distinguishing characteristics. In fact, it says, in darkness is upon the face of the deep. It almost sounds like it's all just water, right? Um, and God, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And then, of course, in verse 3, it says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and evening and morning were the first day. Okay, so, day one, he made the heaven and the earth, right? He made, uh, obviously, water, because part of the earth was water, and he made light, okay, because that's even what's going to uh, distinguish a, a day, right, from light to darkness, right? And then in verse 6, it says, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the, the waters. So what does he do? He has water, and he's dividing the waters. What did it say in Psalm 24? For he had founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Well, I don't know if we learn enough here, but we see that water is part of his creation, how he separated it, right? What's the firmament? It's a sky. So he's got water underneath the firmament and has water above the firmament. So somewhere there's water above the sky is what it looks like to me. Okay, so he's dividing water. It says in verse 8, And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and morning of the second day. In verse 9, God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together onto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. So verse 9 tells me that it sounds like everything was covered underwater. Now he's making dry land appear. Okay? So remember, Psalm 24, 2. For he had founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Is that what he means? It started out with all water covered and now he's brought up you know, some dry land by grouping the water? Maybe. And verse 10, it says, And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called these seas, and God saw that it was good. And it came to pass after seven days, the water, sorry, I'm skipping ahead here. So maybe, maybe that's what he's talking about, right? He's dividing water from water. You've got water under the heaven and water above the heaven. And then he takes the water under the heaven and divides it even more. He calls it seas, right? Oceans and, and lakes and so on. Um, and it has dry land appearing. Now, if you remember, though, Genesis 7, there was a big flood, right? Um, you know, we call it Noah's flood because Noah and his family got to go on earth. And, and in, in Genesis 7, verse, starting verse 10, it says, It came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, 
same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. Now, this sounds like there was water underneath the ground, because it says the fountains of the deep were opened up. So is that maybe what he meant, establishing it upon the floods, that he's got land above water? Because there's even now there's underground lakes, right? There's underground streams. There's, I mean, how else do you drill a well and get water? There's water in, in the ground. But in, in this case, the flood, and, and you know what? It had not rained until this time. And, well, may, why didn't it rain? Well, Genesis 2, chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, says, And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord had not caused it to rain upon the earth. And there was not a man to till the ground, but there went up a mist from the earth, watered the whole face of the ground. Was there not enough water for it to rain, or did God didn't just, maybe God just didn't decide to make it rain yet, right? But when he makes the fountains a deep break open, there's more water. Maybe that starts the precipitation cycle. I don't know. Obviously, misting is, is you know, obviously precipitation of some kind, too. But these fountains that are in the deep, they break open, and you know, people mock at Noah's flood. It's like, you think the mountains could be covered underwater? Well, what they don't realize is maybe some of those mountains were created by the fountains of, of the deep breaking open. And that water pressure pushing. I don't know. I wasn't around in Noah's time. I don't, you know, maybe think I'm that old, but I'm not that old. Okay. And besides, uh, Noah only had his three boys and their wives on his way. Um, It'd be interesting though. Never rained before. Now all of a sudden you got water shooting out of, of the ground. You got rain coming down from the sky. And if you heard Noah's preaching, and I'm sure you would have at least heard it second hand, if you didn't hear it first hand, you say, Oh, maybe Noah's right. Maybe the world is gonna flood. Or you can be a scholar and say, ah no, nah, it's just some water, right? Until you go to high ground and then oh the high it's almost Genesis 8, the water stopped increasing. It says in verse 2 and 3, it says, The fountains also the deep, and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters returned from off the earth continually, and after the end of the hundred years were abated. Now, where could the water go? Everything's flooded. It's going to go back underground. Right? There's, there's got to be some caverns or something that can fill up. So, when he says in, in Psalm 24, verse 2, For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods, maybe it's talking about the water that's underground. Maybe, right? Or maybe he's just because, you know, the whole earth was covered with water, then God made dry land appear. I don't know, but those are a couple things to think about, right? It's very interesting. It never rained, and then all of a sudden rain. Fountains of deep break open, and you have all sorts of changes. And I, and I personally, this is my... Yes, right? And the scripture doesn't tell us. But I think the mountains, some of the mountains were, the bigger mountains were formed by that, right? But I, I believe my God's strong enough. He could even cover Mount Everest with water if he wanted to. Now he won't anymore because he made a promise, right? And he, he gave us a rainbow to tell us he never flood everything again. But I think he's powerful enough to do that. So we're going we're, we're gonna to have another big change coming up. Okay, because it was a big change. I mean, first of all, I mean, no man was around to see the, you know, the dry land appear and all that because God hadn't made man yet on the first day, right? But then that was a big change when everything got covered with water. You got the fountains deep breaking up, you got the rain coming. So Noah, I mean, more than Noah got to see it, but no, only Noah and his family survived to tell about it, right? But we got another big change coming. It was after the rapture. Okay, in, in Revelation 21, 1, it says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth, first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Now that's going to be interesting, right? No more ocean. You know what the first thing it does? And, and you homeschoolers will probably correct me, but did, didn't they teach us that the earth was covered by about 75% water? And all of a sudden, we have four times the land than what we have now. So the earth is not going to be overcrowded, even though, you know, the Christians of all ages, right, from from Genesis 1 all the way till 
the rapture are going to be on the earth, populating the earth, plus there's going to be some other people in the millennium. Um, now, I don't remember if this, this no more scenes in the millennium or, or if it's uh, after that. Um, but there's going to be no more sea. There's going to be a lot more land to uh, explore, but not only that, the whole earth is going to be changing because all the, you know, the fire and brimstone and everything, you know, every mountain's going to be made low, you know, and the islands and every, everything's like going to change, right? But the one big change is no more sea. Where's that water going to go? I don't know. I have my guesses. But when I guess something, it's like trying to guess a number from 1 to 10 or 1 to 1,000. I'm just making a guess, right? So don't say, oh, Jim thinks this and this. But I know one thing, that the hell is going to be cast into the lake of fire. Well, what, what's happening to that space where hell was? I don't know. Maybe the sea vanishes into the salt. Water. I don't know. It's just a guess, right? Um, but there's no more sea. Wherever it goes, maybe it just goes under the ground to the surface of the earth. Who knows? Okay? I'm not trying to say, you know, some weird doctrine that the Bible doesn't say this is just a guess. Right? That'd be like trying to guess what kind of, you know, fruit grew on the tree that Adam and Eve ate. I don't know, but it tell us, right? All he knows is no more sea. That's going to be interesting. And you know what? That tells me that God had a plan so that if every single person had gotten saved, there'd be enough room on earth for them. Right? What do we, how many people do they say we have now on earth? Is it like 30 billion? Anybody know? 8 billion? 8 billion? So even if we say it was, you know, 10 times that, 80 billion or 800 billion. There's enough room for everybody. Right? People don't understand because they live all their life in a city and they don't see all the empty spaces in Manitoba or Saskatchewan, right? Driving through Saskatchewan, you see some empty spaces there. And the States has lots of empty land too. There's enough for everybody to have a little farm, right? And we could, you know, all we'll be self sufficient as far as. Growing our own food, obviously not self-sufficient because we need the Lord and we want the Lord. But there's lots of room, and everybody from and there'd be enough room if everybody and all, and this is what I'm guessing, but that all the generations had been obeying God and been fruitful and multiplying. Right? God had a plan: drain the ocean, and then there's lots of land there. So that's going to be interesting. I hope we can hunt in the millennium. Actually, there is a verse about fishing in the Revelation, where it's uh, Ezekiel. Anyway, all right, so no more sea, right? But then he goes on in verse 2, Revelation 21, 2. Now John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And that, actually, I think this is after the thousand years, if I'm, I'm right. Because obviously there's going to be death before the millennium is, is done, or at the end of the millennium, right? So after that, there's going to be no more death. So at, after the millennium, there's going to be no more sea. But, you say, well, it says a new heaven and a new earth, are we going to be on a completely separate sphere? No, because there's, and it's not part of my sermon, but there's a verse that says the earth abideth forever. But it even says springtime and harvest is going to be here forever. And, and so God's going to make all things new, and don't you think that's making all things new when there's no more sea? Don't you think it's making all things new when you've got hailstones of, of uh, brimstone coming down that are talent? Heavy, it could destroy buildings. Right? Just flat. Oh, we're gonna build such. We're gonna build it like a, the Tower of Babel or something, or the pyramids. I don't care what it is. If God wants to destroy it, He will destroy it. He's gonna make all things new. Right? We can't be like Absalom and rear up a pillar for ourselves. It's gonna be stay into the millennium. No, it's gonna. Everything's gonna be destroyed. God's gonna reshape the earth how He wants it reshaped. And it, these environmentalists, they're so worried, oh, we're going to destroy the earth. Guess what? God's going to destroy the earth, the face of the earth. You just got to worry about getting right with the Lord. That's what you got to worry about. Because he will destroy the earth. That will be global warming when there's fire and brimstone raining from, from 
the sky like a half hour or whatever after we leave. Right? That is going to be global warming. And you, I don't care how many cardboard straws you suck on, you're still going to have that global warming. Stopping plastic is not going to stop global warming. God's going to like melt elements with the fervent heat. You got no chance of stopping that global warming. You got change coming. That's really interesting. Um, in Revelation 22, actually, let me, yeah, let me go to Revelation 22. Um, I get to this. In Psalm 24, verse 3 says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Now, I don't believe that's not seeking Jacob's face. It's seeking the Lord's face. But David's saying, this is the generation of them that seek thy face. And he's saying, O Jacob. Right? He's like saying, this is the generation of them that seek the Lord. Like, Jacob, pay attention. Right? That's the way I understand it. But it's interesting to say, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Where's the hill of the Lord? Well, um, Zion, right? Zion is the name of the hill. Um, you know, the temple used to be there. Uh, it will be there again. In Psalm 15, starting with verse 1, it says, who sh Sorry, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth his own hurt and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. So there's a long list of things here. And said, those people that don't do those things and do those good things, they can dwell in the holy hill. They can dwell in the tabernacle. Is this teaching workspace salvation? No, it's not. You know that the Bible says that, that nobody will go to heaven that, that telleth a lie, like one lie, and everybody's lie. Right? So when we have that righteousness of Christ applied to us, and we, we get to wear that, uh, that white garment that is provided to us, it's like we haven't done that. Okay? And so when Psalm 24 says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? You have clean hands. A pure heart. Well, that our hands will be cleansed, our heart is cleansed, and you know these these different things. Now, it could also be referring to there's extra rewards for people that do have clean hands, like that, that do the works and try to please the Lord. But I, I'm not quite sure that that's this is talking about that, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. Um, and so in Psalm two verse six it says, "Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion." Like, that's where I believe New Jerusalem is going to be, right? And um, Jesus is going to rule and reign from there with a rod of iron, by the way, my dad. And, you know, when it, it talks about the dimensions of New Jerusalem, I think it's, um, I think it's 1,600 furlongs by 1,600 furlongs by 1,600 furlongs. Now, if you divide that, I think a furlong is an eighth of a mile. That make it 200 miles by 200 miles by 200 miles. 200 miles high is a hill. Now, I don't think the hill of Zion is 200 miles. So there's something mysterious about that, that third dimension that, that who knows, we'll find it. Doesn't, don't people like surprises? Right? I know some of you open your Christmas presents on the 24th. There's nothing in the Bible that says you can't. But I like surprises. I like to wait till the day of the surprise. I don't want her open, like, if my wife is so kind and buys me a birthday present, this isn't a hint or anything like that. But if she does, I won't wait till my birthday, not the day before my birthday. Right? So we'll find out what heavenly Jerusalem was like. But it's still fun to speculate. Right? But the thing is, New Jerusalem isn't the package you can look at the size and kind of shake it and listen. Right? You can't do that. 
But we do get some hints in the Bible. There's nothing wrong with looking at it, studying it, saying, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Um, as long as you're not dogmatic, it looks something. Uh, that's just a guess. But I do know that it comes down out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. And if, isn't there, I don't know if there's anybody that puts more effort into their looks than a bride adorning herself or her husband on the, on the wedding day. They really um, care about that. You know, guys, we just try to take a clean shirt from the top of the pile and comb our hair. We still have some. And I mean, no, we do. Like, we dress up a little bit for weddings, right? But, um, you know, you know we should actually put a little bit of effort on that face. But a bride, she puts a lot more effort in, right? And, and so then a voice comes from heaven, like we read in Revelation 21. You know, the tabernacle of God is with men. That means God's going to live with us. Isn't that going to be great? It says, He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people. And God Himself shall be with them and be their God. He's going to wipe away our tears. There's not going to be any more death, any more sorrow, no crying, any of that. No more pain. The former things are passed away. It's going to be great. It's going to be good. Now, what is this talking about, though, those that have clean hands? Like I say, we have been washed in the blood. In Revelation 22, verse 14 and 15, it says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Which city would that become? Is it New Jerusalem, right? It says, For what without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and adulterers and whosoever loveth and maketh a, or sorry, a lie. That doesn't mean they're right outside the gates of New Jerusalem. That wouldn't be fun being in Jerusalem. In fact, month to month, we're going to go look on the carcasses of those right, that, that didn't get saved. Um, but they're without. They're, they're, they're without as far as they're in the lake of fire. Isn't it interesting how science actually proves the Bible, right? Even though you might not know it now, right? The Bible talks about how hell is in the center of the earth, and then they do their experiments and their uh, you know, uh, hypothesis and all that stuff. And they hear, oh, the center of Earth is hot. There's plasma on there and blah, blah, blah. It's hell, right? And then they do science. Oh, there's this black holes. And once something goes in there, it can never go up, come out again. And it's just like dark concentra or it's like concentration of mass. And the gravity is so strong. And I don't know. I've never been there. I'm never going to go there. But this is a guess again. What if hell gets thrown into the lake? Oh, sorry. Get, does get thrown in the lake of fire, whether that's a black hole. Wouldn't surprise me. I'm not saying that it does happen. Really. I'm just saying it wouldn't surprise me. Because science doesn't contradict the Bible. God could have a different way, a different place that's called the lake of fire. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is it's just fun to speculate sometimes, right? And so they're without. We're not going to be right outside the gate. In fact, we're going to be able to go in and out the gate. It's not like we're just stuck in the city. We're going to be able to go through the whole earth. We have the right to the tree of life. We get to pick that fruit that's a different fruit every month. Now, Adam and Eve used to be able to eat from this fruit of this tree. But then they ate from that other tree that God told them not to, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Right? So they ate from that tree and they realized they're naked and all this, right? And God said, no, we're not going to let them eat from that tree anymore because otherwise they're going to live forever. And then we don't want that, right? And it's interesting he uses plural in, in that, but um, that's for a different sermon. So we have the right to eat a tree of life. And it even says that leaves are for the healing of the nations, right? A different fruit every month. That'd be cool. And maybe a new fruit we don't even know right now right? because it's a different kind of tree. Very interesting stuff. You may have the right to the tree of life. So I don't think uh, Psalm 24 or Psalm 15 is saying only special people will have access to the tabernacle. Only special people will be able to go through the gate. Yeah, special people, but saved people, forgiven people, right? Because without it are dogs and sorcerers. Because in Revelation 3, if you're in Revelation, you might as well turn to Revelation 3. And here's what I'll tell you that I believe everybody gets 
go into the city. Every saved person, that is. Because in Revelation 3, verse 20, sorry, verse 20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down on my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So Jesus is saying, to him that overcometh, you get to sit with Jesus in his throne, right beside him. I guess a throne is a, a wide seat that more than one person can sit in, right? It's a throne of a king, or you'd think it would be majestic and very beautiful. And Jesus is saying, if you're one of those that have overcame, you get to sit with Jesus in the throne. And you know why Jesus is sitting beside the Father, too. But what does that overcome with me? Well, in 1 John 5, starting verse 1, it says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. But this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Right? Because that, that's, that's how we can tell we love God. We're actually doing his commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Not if you're saved, you will do the commandments. No, if you are saved and you love him, you'll do the commandments. And it says in verse 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. Now listen to this closely. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So our faith is what overcomes the world. And if you have believed on Jesus Christ, you have overcome. And because you've overcome, you get to sit with Jesus in his throne. You get to go through that gate. You get to be in New Jerusalem. You get to go in the tabernacle. You get to dwell with God. That's part of the promise. In case you didn't understand it, he says in verse 5, he said, Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. You're saved, you believe that, and you get these this inheritance, this, this right, this, this thing that you get. Now, there's special rewards on top of that, but the base package is really, really good, right? I mean, it's like, even if you just get the basic, even if you're one of those preachers that preach falsely, but you're saved, let's say, oh, but it's okay if people, you know, fornicate as long as they love each other. That's really wicked. But if that person was saved that said that, the Bible says you're going to be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, and they should be. Still in the kingdom of heaven, though. And they get to still go on the gate. Still get to go sit with Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd rather, you know, please him than displease him. And I don't want to be the least, but the least is still got a good path. It's still a good reward. still a good inheritance. So, when he says, Who shall ascend in the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. So it's not lifted up a soul to vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. It's as if you have never done any of those things when you get forgiven by Jesus. Okay? We get to put on a white garment. In fact, don't we get a rock with a new name written that, that we don't know, nobody knows, Jesus knows? My name might not be Jim anymore. You know, after the rapture, when I get my new name. And it's probably good he does that, right? Because... <laughs> How many gyms do you think there are? They're saved, right? There's probably a lot of gyms. Probably a lot more Johns and James, right? And so on. But it's probably good. He gives everybody a new name, a new start. Like, maybe you've got a name you don't like. As far as, not that oh, I don't like it, but one of your parents were so weird, they called you Jezebel or something. Isn't it good that Jesus will give you a new name? Like, I mean, there's other ones. Like, you're a kid called Gahab or something, right? Like, it's, it's good that he's given us new names. I like my. I happen to like my name, like all of my names. But the, you know, there's people like we're named. Like, what if, what if, uh, what's his name? I was gonna say Tesla, but what if Elon Musk's kid actually gets saved? And that, it's like a name that nobody can even pronounce. I think it's got like letters and numbers and stuff like that, right? Like, I'd be looking forward to a new name if I had a name like that. Now let's look at verse seven, Psalm twenty-four, starting verse seven. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Now, I don't have this in my notes, but when the tabernacle was at the temple, 
it had this this this, this uh, wall around it, right? And there's gates. There's one gate that's only for the king to walk in, right? And so here it's talking about like open up, Jesus is coming, right? Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lift up your everlasting doors. The King of Glory shall come in. That's gonna be great, right? Just seeing Jesus, you know, um, it'll be you know, kings now have like this long procession sometimes, especially if it's a wedding or a funeral or something. Jesus is, however he does his entering, it was by himself, or however he does, it's going to be even better than any king on earth. So who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Isn't it interesting? He's talking about sending him to the hill of the Lord, and there's something with these gates, and Jesus is going to come into the gate. So who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory, Selah. So what are these last four verses? I think these last four verses are there so we consider him. Consider his might. Consider his power, his strength. Right? He wants us to know. Um, a verse just popped in my head, but uh, not clearly. I think I know where it is. So the king of glory, why is it called king of glory? Because he's got honor, right? He's got glory. And you know, the Bible talks about a star having glory, like a brightness, right? I mean, Moses, when he looked on the glory of God, his face shone, right? He had to wear a veil. And so God is going to have this glory. He is the king of glory, but he's got all this power. And I thought I remembered a verse. And maybe... I don't know if this is the one I was thinking, but this one uh, might work in uh, Ephesians 1, starting verse 17. says, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance is in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. So, Paul is, 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 is writing a letter to the Ephesians. He wants them to understand. He wants their eyes to be open. How powerful God is. Right? And the riches of his glory. And how, how great that is. And how he's far above everything. Even principalities. And power and might and all these things. And dominion. And every name that is named. And he just goes on and on. Right? And I think these last four verses are just for us to, hey, consider God. How great he is. How powerful he is. How mighty he is. Right? And, um, Psalm 50, because it says, the Lord mighty in battle. He's stronger than any army that can come against you. You know, we shouldn't fear man that after he's killed us, he's killed the body, there's nothing more they can do to us. Right? So we should fear the Lord who has power to cast people into hell. In Psalm 50, starting verse 22, it says, now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. Whose author of praise glorifies me to him that ordereth his conversation the right will I show the salvation of God. And again, salvation is not always taught in the salvation of the soul. In Ecclesiastes 7, in turn to Psalm chapter 8, we're going to end in Psalm chapter 8. In Ecclesiastes 7, verse 13, it says, Consider the work of God. For who can make that straight which he hath made crooked? Nobody, right? You can't make things straight that are crooked, that God has made crooked, and he's decided to make crooked. You can try, but still, it's going to fall apart, right? He's, I mean, eventually things will just change. Like, let's say you try to make the crooked river straight. You know what's going to happen? 
it, it's just with the, the currencies of that, it's going to start going like this again. It's going to root the banks. It's going to go crooked again. God made it crooked. It's going to go crooked. Well, what if you put concrete? Yeah, well, that'll delay it. Even concrete can get broken. So nobody can stop God. Nobody can uh, make that straight which he had made crooked. You, you can't. In fact, why try to find it? Just go along with how he made things. So Psalm 8, we want to end here. It says in sort of verse 3, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, thou hast put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. So the psalmist here is saying, I consider the heavens. Like, as a kid, I would sometimes like lay on my back. This is before the, the chemtrails. Look at the clouds and look at the shapes. Oh, that one looks like this, and that one looks like that. Or, or, you, or you look up at the stars. I still sometimes look up at the stars. It's clear. And you should, we should do that. We should consider the heavens. Consider nature. Right? Like, you know, it's big and how small it makes you feel. Right? Have you ever gone on a lake and you can't see the other side? Right? So go, go to a And if we consider how much how bigger God is, how more powerful he is than us, and we consider that, then the Bible says, what is man that thou art mindful of? Why do you even care about us? Because we're so small, right? You made such big and mighty things. And you made us a little bit small, lower than the angels. Now, um, so, you know, some of these things can have double meaning, but he's made man smaller than the angels, and he's given us dominion over animals, all the animals, right? In fact, that's why they, that, that outdoor store they call dominion outdoors is because of this, this verse, right? But thou mayest him to have dominion over the works of the ants. Thou hast put all the things under his feet. Dominion over the animals, because God has given us a brain, right? He's given us reasoning. He's like, we can figure out witty and And so God is so great, and He's He's done this, but He gave us control over. It. He's you know He's um, He's mindful of us. He's cared about us, and He all of our hairs in our head are not numbered. And He's not going to let anything happen to us unless it's He allows it, right? And so I think this would be amazing to hear, um, you know, the music, especially the original music. But it's just like wow. Have you considered that? Have you considered the heavens? And why does God even care about us? Well, we're made in the image of God, right? And so we should think, well, God did take time to consider us. He did take time and he sent his son, right? So many, like over 2,000 years ago, and to die for us. He cared enough for us. Even though he is God, he made everything. He's better than us. We should consider him and give him thanks. We should tell him how excellent his name is, like the verse 9 says there. So um, I hope that's been a help to you. And it just, it, it's amazing. God owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. King Ranch maybe think they own most of the cattle or Singleton Ranch or some of these people. Those are his too, right? Because he, he could snuff out the life of these people just like that, and all the heirs' life, and then all of a sudden, oh, it's the government's. I mean, he decides what he wants to do with it. People think they have devised something. People think they have a plan. They think how they're going to get wealthy, but God can just destroy it in a matter of a moment. So it's important to, to glory your maker and give him honor because he can do with it whatever he wants. And it's really great what he has for those that have overcome through faith in his name. And then only even better than earning it. Hasn't come to offer that yet. Like it's so great, just the minimum. But to earn rewards on top of that yet, it's like 
more than your mind can even comprehend. Help us uh, in this way. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for these things to, to give us uh, encouragement and to get us excited about the future and how there will be no more sorrow, no more death, and we'll wipe the tears from our eyes. And how we'll just be forever happy with you and get to dwell with you. Thank you, God, and your name is worthy to be praised. Help us learn how to do it better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.